That kind of opens it up so that I can kind of tell a bit of a story about uh, encou uh, our encounter with BBD at, at Daisy, and um, kind of talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges that, that we faced and, and kind of how we, we went about solving some of those challenges. So um, just in kind of in, in, in overview, just talk a little bit about what Daisy is, what we do, uh, talk a little bit about... Uh, the challenges that we started to see in the fall of 2014. Oh, I got a picture right here. That's handy. Molecular testing, kind of what we went uh, in the way of automating that system, our testing programs, what we found, and then kind of what we're thinking about doing next. And so um, this is Maureen. Uh, this is one of my clients at Daisy. Um, all of our animals, we, we kind of start to get to know them as they come through, as our samples come through the lab quite a bit. Um, and a uh, little bit about our facility. We're on 7,600 acres in northeast Texas. Uh, this facility here is uh, what we call our revenue site. About a mile and a half away is where we have uh, the heifer raising. Um, so you'll see kind of three barns in the front there. We've actually added a fourth barn since, and we're continuing to grow. We've got around 3,000 animals on site, many of those high genomic animals. Um, as well as our recep herd. And uh, we just recently started a, a, a beef herd in addition. So milking parlor, kind of just give you an idea of what our facilities look like. Um, all, of our, all of our barns are actually designed with both of these types of really big fans in the middle as well as fans on the side. We call them bivent uh, facilities. And the reason for that is it's really hot and humid in the summer in Texas, so we have to keep our animals cool. Um, and, and we also raise our own raise our own calves. So, what what really started to happen in 2014 is we started to notice in the fall a real big step up in instances of pneumonia, scours. Um, we, we we kind of started to see a lot of these problems in our young stock, um, and a little bit of pneumonia in our older stock. And uh, the, kind of really the first question was, what are we dealing with? And so. Uh, as a pathologist, what I really like to do is the first thing I want to do is get a sample of something and put it under the microscope and take a look. And this is what we found. So these are bacteria, very clearly. Uh, there, you'll actually notice there are two different types of bacteria, although most, most of these are cocci, so the round guys right here, and the rod-shaped right there. So we kind of made the assumption, at least initially, that what we were dealing with was primarily bacterial. So run, some, run some culture using uh, the Vitex system. And actually what we found in that sample was Staph scurry, not you know, fairly common uh, type of uh, bacteria, definitely is uh, kind of something you'd find on your skin. But we didn't just do this one time, we did it a number of times. Um, and as we did, we, we kind of started to notice a pattern about the types of bacteria that we were identifying. Uh, nearly all of the samples that we were getting back, you typically don't see unless there's some class of immunocompromise. And so when you kind of take the clinical symptomology um, and, and mix it with the bacteriology, we were starting to kind of think, well, this is probably not purely bacterial. There's probably more at play. So these are some of the histopath samples that came back. We did have uh, mortality at some point hitting 10 and 20 percent of our new calf stock, which was uh, quite disappointing. But what you can kind of see in the pathology slides uh, is there are definitely the rod-shaped bacteria uh, in our samples. Um, and as I kind of go through these a little bit, what you'll also notice is while there's lots and lots of bacteria, there's really not a lot of lymphocytes and monocytes and immune cells. Um, and so that kind of told us that, again, we're dealing with something where maybe the immune system is not quite responding or something's going on, or, or maybe it's a, a postmortem infection. Um, you'll also notice that in all of these histo slides, these are all rod-shaped bacteria. They really didn't look like the bacteria we were seeing in the sputum samples. And that, again, was kind of one of those indications that we're really not sure what we're dealing with. And so we decided to attack this slightly differently. We said, all right, we know that we have a bacterial infection. It's probably secondary. So the chances are we need to start looking viral. 
And we started to do that with, with uh, PCR kits. So we looked at BSRV, IBR, parainfluenza 3. We did um, probably north of 100 of these types of samples. And out of all those, we got one positive for BSRV, and that's about it. So now what? Well, again, in looking at our bacteriology and in our virology, we started to think we know something's going on. We haven't discovered it yet. We need something else to think about. Well, the immunology background, I want to look at some serology. So we sampled a, a large number of animals, and we ran some of these serologies in-house. We sent a lot of them out. Um, we, we did kind of serology for all these things, but the, the interesting finding out of that, 1% instance of BBD. So um, with that 1% instance, we now kind of were at a crossroads, right? So serology just tells us that we have BVD somewhere. It doesn't tell us if we've got PIs. It doesn't tell us exactly what we're dealing with. And so at that point, uh, we kind of started down the path of saying, well, now we want to think about a test that's going to really work for actually finding the presence of the organism as opposed to serology, which just tells us whether or not they've been exposed. And so that's kind of why we went down the route, the, the route of thinking real-time PCR. Um, so the, the good things about PCR, it is relatively specific. It's very, very sensitive. Um, and when you have your own micro, uh, molecular pathology lab on site, it's incredibly fast. So we can go from sampling in the morning to having results in the afternoon to uh, taking uh, measures later that afternoon if we need to. Unfortunately, the kits and systems that are out there currently have relatively low throughput. So if we've got 3,000 animals and we want to test all of them or we get a, a load of animals in and we want to be able to turn that around, taking advantage of the speed, 44 to 48 tests per eight-hour shift is just a little too slow. So the next step was to start thinking about how we might automate that process. And so we, we banged heads with, uh, with some good folks at Thermo. They're actually here today. And... Uh, yeah, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and uh, we came up with this. This is the, the Kingfisher Flex system. It's designed to do 96 extractions at any one time. So the first step of, of any PCR uh, testing is going to be an extraction. So we set up the Kingfisher. This is it fully loaded. So you put on a, a number of plates. You put your 96 samples onto the system. And you pretty much hit a button and let it do its thing. And by the time you come back, it gives you a, a plate, looks a lot like this, uh, with your, your DNA, or in, sorry, in this case, your RNA already on, the, uh, already on the plate. You can either use manual or automated liquid handling then to put it on a PCR plate and then go back to your PCR unit and get moving. So it's one thing to talk about how to do a test. It's another thing to talk about how you're going to use that test. And so... In terms of our testing programs, we knew we had some of those other things that we saw. We wanted to use a combination of serology and PCR. Uh, but then when do you test? Uh, we don't have a breeding season. We calve in all year long. And we calve in between one and 200 new calves every single month. And so we don't have the ability to kind of pause our program, test everybody, and then keep right on going. We've got to be able to do this day in, day out, every day, uh, all year long. So... We knew that there would be certain breakpoints that we would definitely want to hit. So any time a new animal was possibly being introduced to the, to the herd, we'd actually have them sample at the location where that animal was, submit those to our laboratory, and then when they arrived, we'd quarantine and test a second time. Um, so all, all purchased animals basically would get tested pre and post, and before they were released from quarantine, they'd have to get that double negative test. Um, anytime we move across our facility, 7,600 acres is a really, really big space. Um, I don't know how many of you are from Texas, but if you've ever seen Lake Grapevine, that's around 8,000 square acres, so just a little bit smaller than that. It's a really, really big space. Um, so as we move animals from facility to facility, be it from our heifer raising facility to our revenue sites, we want to make sure that something may not have happened in transit. Uh, we test all animals 21 days prior, or basically a close-up 21 days prior to calving. So, that, so this is what we found. In December of 14, we found three positive animals. It turned out one of those was PI. We removed those three animals from the herd. Um, and you can kind of see with all those beautiful blue bars, we haven't had a positive since. 
So in terms of improving the workflow, we were able to get up to, instead of that 44 samples per day, we were now talking about 760 samples per day. So that's good from the, from the point of view that if we had an outbreak, we'd be able to test the entire, the entire herd within a matter of days, if that became necessary. Uh, but the place where this is really hand handy is that if you've only got a smaller number of samples, you don't need to allocate a technician for the whole day to knock out 40 samples. They can work for an hour to two hours and then go on to other testing. So speed just isn't about volume. It's also about being able to have the ability to do other tests. Uh, we did about 1,400 or so samples for VBD in 2014-15. Um, I don't have the data from 2016, but I can tell you we have had no more, no more positives. Um, we did have those three positive for BVD in November, and none positive since. Unfortunately, the scours continued. And so when originally we were thinking about having this conversation, we really thought that BVD was likely to be our problem. We had done all the testing, we had started to see improvement, uh, and, and it kind of went away, but unfortunately we still hadn't quite solved that problem. And so just to kind of close out the, the story about the pneumonia, we used RNA sequencing, uh, which is another project that we're working with on, on Thermo to implement, and we actually found coronavirus, very high titers um, in our young calves. And so I'm very happy to report that since we began vaccinating for it about seven weeks ago, we've been able to uh, bring that caseload down about 80%, and we think we're well on the road to eradicating the problem. But in terms of, of BVD, we kind of view it as part of a larger disease prevention uh, and health promotion strategy. So we don't just use this workflow for BVD, we use it for a variety of testing scenarios across the, across the facility. I think probably one of the most successful of those would be our mastitis testing program. Uh, and again, it's the same thing, we're taking advantage of the speed of PCR we can actually select an antibiotic, the appropriate antibiotic to use for the species that, that's infecting that animal because we can get those results back in three to five hours. And so um, it, while we started down that road of using this, this workflow specifically for BBD, we found many other op applications uh, to be able to use that same technology and that same workflow. Um, I think the current strategy of serology and PCR does a relatively good job, uh, it, but it only really covers about two, -third of the, two thirds of the critical infection period. So we're, we're, we're continuing to consider whether or not we really need to test calves as well. We know that would be an, a substantial additional uh, cost, but our focus is to be BVD free and to, to, to really create really high quality animals. <laughs> 